Hi class and welcome to this first this semester's first lab on the scientific method and the metric system. To get to all the lab information, you can scroll down through the module section uh, to the lab one module due Sunday, February 7th. So you guys will have a lab worksheet due every week. Here's the lab PowerPoint that I'm gonna talk through tonight. The lab online worksheet is shown here. Here's a great YouTube um, helping video about the metric system, which I would encourage you guys all to watch. And then this is where you can submit your lab one worksheet. So you'll have to download the worksheet, fill it in, write in your answers, take a picture of it, and then upload the file, whether that's a picture or the Word document file um, here where it says submit the lab one worksheet. And again, the due date is February 7th. Also here as under lab one, I've included a lab one discussion where if you have any questions about this week's lab, you can post your question here and I'll do this for every lab. And I'll try to watch the discussion throughout the week or at least before it's due to try to answer any questions as well as feel free to email me or message me if you have other um, questions. And then uh, the lab one quiz will always be due the following Sunday. So you have a lab worksheet to do every week so this lab worksheet is due Sunday, February 7th at midnight. And then the lab one quiz, I'll leave open. Um, you'll get one chance to take it. And then I'll leave it open all next weekend, the 12th, the 13th, the 14th of February. And it will be due um, the 14th of February at midnight. Keep in mind that you'll have the lab one quiz due on Sunday at the 14th, but you'll also have lab number two due that week because we also have the lab number two worksheet because we have about a worksheet due every week. So let's go through kind of this lab PowerPoint then. So these lab PowerPoints were made kind of by the instructor, um, the chief kind of instructor of this course. That's Professor Cummings and she did a great job of kind of putting this all together. Uh, so lab one is really about the scientific um, method of investigation and also using the metric system to measure things in science. And this is, really gives you a base of all laboratory um, guidelines. If you move on to any sort of research job, laboratory job, or just the ability to read a research paper, this lab provides the basis for how research papers are laid out, as well as how scientists use uh, measurements to prove or disprove their theories. So here are the objectives of this week's lab. We'll talk about the scientific method and then talk about measurements and using um, the metric system to convert uh, one measurement to another. So science is an active process. Uh, it's a way of asking and answering questions about the natural world through phenomena. Scientific investigations share some common elements and procedures. The steps followed are known as the scientific method. Um, and not all science occurs by rigidly following the steps, but most of the elements are usually present in any scientific investigation. Learning about the natural world usually starts by making an observation, um, asking questions about that observation, developing some sort of hypothesis, which is an educated guess to answer a question and test the hypothesis through an experiment and then draw conclusions. This takes us through um, what a hypothesis is. A hypothesis is some sort of explanation of an observed natural phenomenon and leads to predictions that can be tested by observation or experimentation. Uh, when you develop an experiment, an investigator will identify and manage variables. And a variable is any factor that can be controlled, changed, or measured in an experiment. There are three types of variables in scientific experiments. The control variable um, is always held constant and used as a baseline for comparison. And we call that the control group. The independent variable is the one being manipulated, changed, or tested by researchers. And the dependent variable is the responding variable. Data will be collected, will either lead a research to accept or reject the hypothesis. Um, scientific inquiry never pr proves that a hypothesis is true. And the scientific theory is an explanation of some aspect of the natural world based on a body of facts that have been repeatedly confirmed through observation and experimentation. 
So here it takes us through the scientific method and the steps for um, answering the questions. Uh, so you observe something, you ask in a question about an observation or a problem, then you form a hypothesis, which is a tentative explanation of an observed natural phenomena. Um, you perform an experiment, which tests the hypothesis. Um, you collect data, which helps you to see if your hypothesis is true or not. Then you um, perform a conclusion by accepting or rejecting the hypothesis. And then you repeat it uh, in order to try to answer the questions that you formed with the hypothesis. Um, you can put these in um, a published peer-reviewed journal. And peer-reviewed journal means that other scientists will look at what you have worked through and decide if it's um, scientifically correct, if it follows these scientific methods. So peer-reviewed journals contains all articles um, and it gives a really great basis for sharing information uh, that people have conducted in their labs. A variable is any factor that can be controlled, changed, or measured in an experiment. Uh, the controlled variable is always held constant, and this will be used as baseline for comparison, the control group. The independent variable is the one being manipulated or tested by the researcher, and the dependent variable is the responding variable. Uh, science is both a body of knowledge and a process. So science is the study of the natural world. Uh, science can be two things, knowledge about the natural world, sorry for that typo there, as well as a process used to acquire knowledge, which we talked about in the scientific method. Uh, dative can be, data can be quantitative or qualitative. Quantitative data means that it uses numbers and statistical analysis to compare those numbers. Qualitative data means it's more descriptive and uses words. The scientific theory uh, is a hypothesis that has been repeatedly tested and supported by a wide variety, variety of evidence. It has explanatory power and it can be overturned with new evidence. So that is a scientific theory. Um, you can have research that's experimental or descriptive. Experimental research is manipulation and controlled testing. And descriptive research is more observation and description in the research. So an example of all of this to kind of can, um, tie it together is, does listening to music alter the heart rate? You would probably think, yes, of course, because if you listen to really slow, quiet, relaxed music, you'll fall asleep. If you listen to music that pumps you up, maybe when you're working out or right before a sporting event, that'll probably increase your heart rate. But regardless, um, that's kind of an observation. Does listening to music alter the heart rate? The hypothesis then is a statement that answers that question that has been raised. Uh, listening to music will slow the heart rate. So that's the hypothesis. And then your experiment will be to measure the heart rate at rest when quiet and measure the heart rate when listening to music. Uh, the variables, the controlled variable will be no sound, resting heart rate with no music being played because that's the baseline. The independent variable uh, will be when music is played and measuring the heart rate then. Um, so that is always changing. And the dependent variable will be the heart rate because that will be what is always changing. Uh, critical thinking is really important in science um, because you want to become a skeptic of anything that you observe or read in a journal. Um, you should become a skeptic. Always ask yourself, is this really true? Uh, try to research for yourself what is true. Consider the source of the information. Appreciate the value of statistics, um, which uses math to describe data. Learn to read graphs, distinguish anecdotes from scientific evidence and separate facts um, from somebody's opinion is very important. The role of science in society is incredibly important. It improves technology and human condition, especially with health. Um, we're going through a pandemic, a pandemic and a vaccine was just discovered. And um, it's just awesome that we um, have this vaccine readily available. Science helps us to make informed decisions, but also science has limits um, because a new um, theory could be overturned by new evidence. Um, but that's what makes science so, so exciting um, is it's constantly learning about um, the world around you and using that evidence to create new theories. And the metric system then is the way 
um, that scientists use to communicate with one another in a precise fashion with data. So it's necessary that all scientists around the world use an identical way of describing things such that they can all share the results and duplicate each other's procedures. The measuring system used throughout most of the world is the metric system. It's a decimal system based on tens and weight, length, volume, and temperature are all measured in this manner. Unlike other measuring systems, the metric system allows for conversion between volume and weight for water. So one cubic centimeter of water is equal to one milliliter, and that's equal to one gram. And a cubic centimeter um, is a form of volume for water. So the metric system has basic units where length is a meter, weight is a gram, a gram is about the weight of a paper clip, and the volume is the liter. So these are the basic units of the metric system. Common items that are one meter in length, um, the height of a countertop, five steps of a staircase, half the length of a bed, a little more than a yard. Um, a gram is about the weight of a paper clip, a pen cap, a thumbtack, or any US bill. And common items that have a one milliliter volume are 20 drops of water. So here's the metric system, the symbol, the prefix, the signification, um, and what that means. So a kilo has a 1,000 power to it. So a kilogram is 1,000 grams. A hectogram is 100 grams. A decagram is 10 grams. And this refers to the base unit, which can be a meter, liter, or gram. A deci meter is one tenth of a gram, a centimeter is one one hundredth of a gram, a millimeter is one one thousandth of a gram, and we eventually get to on a micrometer, which is one millionth of a gram. And you guys will learn how to convert between um, the base units and the different prefixes. And the video that I posted on YouTube is a great example of how to do that. So when we're converting from a kilogram to a decigram or a kilogram to a milligram, um, all we have to do is place um, kind of the number and the decimal point in the appropriate spot based on this metric conversion chart. And then we just move the decimal to the right or to the left, depending on what way we want to convert it to. So you move the decimal to the right when moving from a larger to a smaller unit, like if we were moving from a kilogram to a centigram, we would move the decimal place over one, two, three, four, five places. And you move the decimal to the left when moving from a smaller to a larger unit. So if we wanted to say um, how many kilograms are in, a mil in 10 milligrams, we move the decimal place over two, three, four, five, six places. Um, to get to kilograms. And the video that I posted really helps um, explain metric conversions. So I, again, please watch that and then ask me any questions. Um, so how many centimeters are in three meters? So we'll go through a couple um, kind of examples here. First, you find the unit you have, which is meters. Find the unit you are changing to, which is centimeters. So we're starting with meters and we're trying to get to centimeters you're counting the number of units in between. So down here, we've laid out the table. And if we're going from a meter, which is the base unit to the centimeter, we have to move our decimal place over two spots. And the decimal place, if they just give you the number, is right here where my cursor is. So we have to move the decimal place over two spots. And when we do that, we fill in those spots with zeros. Um, so three meters is equal to 300 centimeters. So again, we start here with three meters, the base unit, and we're moving over one, two to 300 centimeters. And again, um, this shows you how to move the decimal place over. So if we're talking about, we wanna know how many centimeters are in one kilometer, we start with uh, the kilometer and we put our decimal place after the one, and then we move over we use our chart, we go one, two, three, four, five spots. So we move our decimal place over one, two, three, four, five spaces, and we add in zeros and we get 100,000 centimeters. Uh, for water, one cubic centimeter equals uh, one milliliter of water, which is equal to one gram. So 50 cubic centimeters of water is equal to 50 grams. That's a one-to-one -one conversion. 
50 grams of water is equal to 50 milliliters of water, and 1,000 milliliters of water is equal to 1,000 grams of water. Um, a meniscus is a special way for um, measuring how much water is in a glass container, um, like a graduated cylinder. And it's an accurate measurement for volume, and it's read from the bottom of the meniscus. So the meniscus is just the word for the curved line um, that a liquid makes when it's in a graduated cylinder, and that's because it kind of holds on or um, is kind of sucked to the side to make this little bowing or curved line. And you're probably wondering, well, what's the measurement of the water in this graduated cylinder? Well, you always measure at eye level from the bottom of the meniscus. So this is about 36, um, 36 and a half milliliters. Temperature conversion then is also really fun to do because in the United States, we talk about temperature in Fahrenheit, but everywhere else in the world pretty much uses Celsius. Um, so you can kind of understand where your friends are coming from if you know how to convert Celsius to Fahrenheit and back and forth. Um, Celsius, the freezing is zero degrees. So at freezing point in Celsius is zero degrees. That's 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Boiling in Celsius for boiling of water is 100 degrees Celsius and that converts to 212 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the boiling point. Converting Celsius to Fahrenheit, all you do is you take the Celsius multiply by 1.8, add 32, and you get Fahrenheit. And when you're converting from Fahrenheit back to Celsius, you take the number of degrees in Fahrenheit, subtract 32, and divide by 1.8. So for this lab, again, complete the worksheet, save it, and then upload it into the Canvas under that module spot, and ask me, ask me questions, post them in the discussion, or send me a message. And thanks for listening, guys.